Australia is a land of extremes. Apocalyptic firestorms, raging floods, and tropical cyclones. The most venomous creatures in the world. Fearsome crocodiles and deadly sharks. In this series, we dive deep into the science behind nature's greatest threats to learn how new technologies and discoveries can help us understand the forces that shape life in Australia and around the world. The history of Australia is also a history of fire. Fire defines life in Australia like nowhere else on Earth. Content, this is a rare situation. We need to pump this here urgently. Bringing destruction. Good luck, boys. Uh, and renewal. As bushfires become more severe and more common, what scientific lessons can we learn from the past? to prepare for the future. There's lessons from our first Australians when it comes to bushfire management. How can artificial intelligence predict how fires will behave? How can we build houses to withstand infernos? And how do we respond when bushfires evolve into something new? A big fireball tornado, look at it. This is rather frightening. In the summer of 2020, the world watched as Australia burned. Clouds of smoke choked its cities. Sydney siders today suffered through some of the worst air quality ever recorded. A warning about what to expect in the future. What became known as Black Summer was just the latest in a series of epic bushfires that had burned into the Australian psyche. As Australia's climate changes and fires become even more frequent and severe, we need to dig down into the science behind Australia's bushfires to find new ways to fight, adapt and survive in a world increasingly shaped by fire. So Australia is a country that's lived with fire throughout geological and historical time. And in fact, our natural ecosystems in many places have co-evolved with fire and actually need fire to allow regeneration of plant species. So in a sense, bushfires and wildfires are a natural part of the ecological and landscape processes in Australia. Eucalypts have evolved alongside fire and make up 75% of Australia's forests. Eucalypts and fire have sort of gone hand in hand in, in, in uh, Australia. Eucalypts have very fine seed and require basically an ash bed or a, a mineral earth soil bed for those seeds to, to germinate and propagate. So wherever you get this bare ground produced by the fire, the eucalypts will do very well. Over millions of years, eucalypts evolved to not only require, but also drive bushfire, using it to spread and replace other species. So fire is just as important as the, the sun, as the, the wind, as the, the, the rain is, because basically what it's doing is recycling nutrients and it's recycling the, the energy in the system. Regular burning allows that energy to be released gradually but when years pass between fires, that stored energy builds up. So the energy can be stored in the system for a certain period of time, but eventually that energy has to be released. On the 18th of January, 2003, catastrophic conditions threatened Australia's capital city.
scorching temperatures and 80 km per hour winds threaten to drive a wall of fire through the hills west of Canberra. All the signs pointed to a serious blaze. The standard toolkit for firefighting in Australia is based on the combination of terrain, fuel and weather. So we had the fuel, we had the rugged terrain and we knew there would be bad weather days. Bushfire behaviour experts knew the dangers of fires burning on slopes, but these fires were doing something unexpected. The worst fire behaviour, the most intense fire behaviour you can normally expect would be when you have a fire which is moving uphill with the wind. Okay, so you've got the wind pushing it, you've got the slope also driving it faster and, and more intense. Then when you sort of get to the top of that slope, you tend to get a lot of embers being released and they sort of rain down over the other side of the hills. So normally you have the wind blows in a certain direction and that's the way the fire will go. Uh, but there was a number of instances in these fires where the fire actually spread you know, almost at right angles. Fire spread sideways in a completely unexpected way, outflanking firefighters and spreading out of control. Seen recreated in a lab, this seemingly impossible movement is now known as vorticity-driven lateral spread. Using mathematical modelling and lab-based experiments, Professor Jason Sharples has been able to predict the specific conditions that allow fire to behave in this strange way. So you can sort of take all those bits of information that you know are necessary for this phenomenon to occur, and you can actually map them. So you can actually give a map to the operational people managing a fire and say, these are the bits of the landscape that you need to watch out for. But fire that could burn sideways was not the strangest or the most dangerous development that day. Trying to understand what's going on inside a firestorm is, I mean, it's, it's devilishly hard. I mean, what you basically have is a huge, chaotic, turbulent process going on. Multiple scales of interaction between different processes. Hidden by dense smoke, the Canberra fire began to generate its own intense winds. Any fire creates its own weather to an extent. I mean, even you know, candles on a birthday cake. Um, as soon as you have hot, buoyant air moving upwards, you have to suck air in from the sides to replace the air which has moved upwards. A powerful convection column formed. Starting to spin, it sucked in more air again, turbocharging the process. A fire tornado was born. The tornado levelled trees and blew apart houses, lifting off the ground and touching down again almost a kilometre away. Tom Bates just happened to be there taking the video footage. Holy shit. Fireball tornado, look at it. Oh. Using that video footage actually allowed us to apply some analysis to it using uh, geometry and photo analysis to basically say, well, this is how fast the thing's spinning, this is how fast the uh, updrafts are. This is rather frightening. The amateur vision recorded on the day was the first visual confirmation of a fire tornado in history. Against such a fearsome force of nature, there was little firefighters could do. OK, all units on Gukin being dry. It's going across into the pine forest. The fire tornado overwhelmed containment lines and the fire blotted out the midday sun and swept from the bush directly into the suburbs of Australia's capital city. Get in, mate. Quick step. I have flame height probably over 100 feet on Warrigan, but drive, impacting houses over. Concept, this is a real situation. We need some funders here urgently. Please, 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 please. We've got a headlight, Jenna. Yeah, this is Del La Flora. These guys, Jenna, look at these. I'm looking for an ambulance. No, I'm not joking. I really need some urgent funders. I've got houses of light everywhere. So where are you, Del? Go on, you can make drive. Take this track. Do what you can. Yep. So look, boys. Uh, two zero. In uh, all the years of uh, fire protection for Canberra up to 2003, we basically hadn't lost a house. In the one day, we lost over 500 homes. So there was clearly something entirely new going on. 
In the suburbs worst hit by the fire, the destruction seemed random. On the same street, one house would burn while another would be spared. Ember attack is the cause of destruction for most houses lost in bushfires. An ember can drift through the air for kilometers ahead of a fire front. When these extreme fires uh, exhibit dynamic fire behavior, there's a type of ember that's fairly new to our understanding where you get a, a sea of embers blowing across the landscape about a meter deep and it flows like a fluid across the landscape. When they hit the urban edge, sometimes they divide and concentrate into flow lines. And this explains why some houses are left totally unscathed, neighboring houses are totally lost. After the Canberra fires, it became clear that bushfires were able to move beyond forests and invade entire suburbs. In this changed environment, finding new ways to protect homes from fire becomes increasingly important. There are tangible things that can be done to reduce the likelihood of homes catching on fire with bushfires, and it goes from surveying your scene to what's immediately outside the house, designing the house and planning for the emergency. We have to look at building standards. If we want to build in the path of where these fires are going to go in the future, the buildings need to be able to withstand fire. Justin Leonard and his team at the CSIRO have spent years testing the flammability of building materials in the lab. But to assess how well an actual house can withstand bushfire, in 2010, Justin and his team decided to burn one down. To simulate the extreme heat of bushfire flames, a network of propane gas jets are rigged around the house. It's particularly exciting to have a fire that we can adjust and observe. It's almost a fire in captivity. The test house is built like a standard steel-framed home. It's been rigged with over 100 thermocouples, instruments to measure external and internal temperatures. We use temperature measuring devices, radiant heat devices, and toxics analysis to actually understand whether somebody could have survived within that environment. With cameras and fire crew in place, leaf litter is added to the gutters and door frames to match real-world conditions. Five minutes to test. Aiming for three kilowatts. In three, two, one, ignition. The heat generated by the burners increases steadily, simulating an approaching fire front. Five kilowatts. That builds up over 30 minutes, up to a crescendo of something like 40 kilowatts, which is the level of radiant heat you would have when the flames are actually imminent or licking against the house itself. OK, let's, let's bring in um, underburner yeah. and main flame. Okay. Sweeping underneath the house, soon the flames attack the structure from all sides. First, the window fails, and then the door burns through. Through these weak points, superheated smoke floods the house, and the temperature instantly rises to over 200 degrees Celsius. For the first time, firefighters are able to control a bushfire by simply turning off the gas. Surveying the damage, it's clear which are the weak points in the house's design. Definitely a weak link in the process, and you, simply a combination of a timber solid core door and a steel frame isn't, isn't an adequate combination in flame zone. So we can see quite a considerable thermal layering effect, and it seems to be uh, smoke and combustion products that have come from the door and the far window. Look at the heat load that's getting onto this frame. See, that's what's happened. Look, look here. As soon as you reach a door or a window, you've ignited the contents of a room, and then you've got an internal house fire. 
This experiment demonstrates that even well-built houses are only as fire-resistant as their weakest point. Tests like these help shape building standards for bushfire-prone areas. Around Australia, there are over half a million homes within 100 metres of bushland. In an era of intensifying bushfires, entire towns are potentially in harm's way. On the 7th of February 2009, after weeks of intense heat, the forests of the southern state of Victoria exploded in flames. So there had been over 300 fires that day. The sorts of considerations leading a major firefighting effort on a really bad day, it's like a military operation. So you have to have your air force, your ground troops, your artillery, which are the fire trucks. You have to know your enemy, and your enemy is the weather and the terrain and the fuel. And if you get too many fires, you run out of troops. In what became known as Black Saturday, firefighters were overwhelmed by hundreds of fires burning simultaneously. In high winds, the dry eucalypt forests of Victoria burns faster and hotter than anyone had predicted, spiralling out of control. The bark on the eucalypts, if that catches a light, it will burn like a cigar for tens of minutes and it can be lofted in the air in the, the convection column and it can be carried uh, 30, 40 kilometres downwind and start a new fire. So on Black Saturday, there was an instance where that uh, candle type bark basically started a fire 36 kilometres downwind of where it was launched from. It can jump across a lake, it can jump across a, a highway, it can jump across even a township and start new fires down there. Then all of a sudden you get thousands of individual fires that start and within a few minutes those fires start to coalesce. So you don't have a wall of flame coming towards you, you're surrounded by fire and that can happen within a few minutes. People were caught out in a sense because the fire looked like it was 10 kilometres away and the next thing they realised they were surrounded by fire. Shit. Shit. So large bushfires release enormous amounts of heat energy and when they get particularly large they can be truly catastrophic, almost mind-boggling. Some have estimated that when the Marysville Kings Lake fires combined and intensified, they released the same amount of energy as 1,500 Hiroshima-sized atomic weapons in a matter of minutes. A true firestorm is much more intense than just a fire front moving across the landscape. And so the level of fatalities, the level of house loss, the degree of damage to the, the landscape is all accentuated by that um, mass ignition event. Tragically, in one day, over 170 people lost their lives in those catastrophic fires. Yes, yeah, so I was involved as a volunteer firefighter in the aftermath of Black Saturday. We went down, we're helping out down around the uh, Marysville area. It was just like a bomb had gone off. I mean, it was just complete devastation. You know, signposts just bent over, melted in the heat. Houses just completely demolished. Yeah, just uh, getting shivers thinking about it. It's just a scene of complete devastation. Black Saturday, firefighters responded to over 1,100 incidents. Bushfires can be complex and appear unpredictable. 
In an ever-changing environment, firefighters must decide where best to deploy finite resources. When the stakes are life and death, how can leaders be sure they're making the right decisions? So look, on the worst fire danger days, there's so much to juggle in a leadership position. First of all, you have to look at the weather and things like, yes, it's going to be an extreme fire weather day, that's fine, but what time do the winds kick in? In an uncertain environment, understanding how commanders make decisions is critical. Notification of fire has just started at coordinate 290-100. At La Trobe University in Victoria, psychologist Dr. Mary Omade leads a team researching the science behind decision making. When you look at what our brains can do, both in how much information they can keep active, and then you also look at how quickly it, the brain can work, that is how quickly it can process information, there's a mismatch. A fire is an incredibly complex issue with lots of things to keep in mind, lots of uncertainty. In this computer simulation, a commander must respond to a major fire front, but is then confronted by a second, more destructive fire. Consistently, these simulations show that the more time and resources the leader had committed before the second fire started, the less likely they were to change their plans. You've built this picture and you've, you've built a solution to the problem that you've got to deal with. You're working on it, you've committed your people, you've briefed them. The challenge to then pull all that back and start again when a fire is moving so quickly, it's very difficult. As well as contending with multiple fires, leaders must allow for the speed at which they'll spread and incremental changes in conditions can have massive impacts on fire speeds. When winds are below 12 to 15 kilometres an hour, fire spreads very slowly, but above that threshold, they begin to move very fast. Landscape also determines how fast the fire moves, especially when it moves uphill. On flat ground, a fire might take 60 seconds to burn a given distance, but for every 10 degree increase in slope, fire speed doubles. So on a slope of 30 degrees, the fire travels the same distance in only seven and a half seconds. When faced with changing conditions, most firefighters Mary tested underestimated the speed of fires. We're sort of very much thinkers of the present. We're hardwired to sort of think things will keep changing the way they've been changing up to that point. Sorry, right. Thanks. We're going Bye, guys. Let's go. Faced with a dynamic set of threats and with lives on the line, decision makers are pushed to the limits of what people are capable of processing. So are you going to stay or do you want to go into Alex? Well, we grossly overestimate our mental capacity. We overestimate the amount of information we can deal with, or you overestimate the rate at which we can process information. In such a dynamic situation, it can be impossible for leaders to process all the available data. To help them make the right decisions, scientists have developed sophisticated fire simulation programs. Using computer modelling, bushfire behaviourists are now able to map future fires and predict how they'll spread. Often people will say fires are unpredictable, which is not true, because fires still follow the same principles of physics and chemistry as always. Available fuel, the landscape, humidity and wind all influence a fire's behaviour in ways that are incredibly complex, but still predictable. So there's a lot of feedbacks going on in fires. So a colleague and I produced a, a simulator called Phoenix Rapid Fire. What Phoenix Rapid Fire is doing is basically integrating all of those interacting factors and assessing all the feedbacks as to whether it's important, not important at this stage, how important is it, what's it doing, is it changing the spotting, is it changing the flame height, is it changing the rate of spread, is it incorporating more fuel, less fuel. The simulator allows you to bring massive amount of data together 
and allows all those factors to interact and you can get a much more reliable indication of what the fire behaviour is likely to be. These computer simulations of bushfire are of critical importance to firefighters, but also to residents who need to know when to stay and when to evacuate. Modelling can help predict the behaviour of future fires, but in a changing climate, bushfires are increasingly behaving in strange new ways. In 2016 in Tasmania, it wasn't a grass fire or a forest fire that caught scientists' attention, but something they'd never seen before. In the west of Tasmania, the ground itself caught fire. Peat is formed when plants break down in waterlogged conditions. In many countries, peat is harvested and dried to be used as fuel. But in the peatlands of western Tasmania, regular rain kept the peat damp, allowing a strange species of tree to thrive. The pencil pine is a Tasmanian native conifer found nowhere else on Earth. Unlike the eucalyptus, the pencil pine is not used to fire and isn't dependent on seeds to spread. These ancient trees sprout from the roots of a single mother tree that have burrowed through the damp peat to spawn a cluster of clones. Some of these things may have originated from a seed right back at the beginning of the current climate we're in, the end of the Ice Age, which is an astonishing thought that these organisms may be really quite old, not just a thousand years old, they may be thousands of years old. As long as the rain falls and the peat they depend upon stays damp, the pencil pines are safe. But how long can the rain be depended upon? Forest ecologist Jen Steiger has studied the incidence of bushfire in the nearby Tasmanian rainforests and its connection to rainfall. And with climate change predictions, it's likely that Tasmania will become drier and hotter, and so it's likely that we'll lose a lot of that rainforest. By analysing climate data and fire maps, Jen Steiger found a correlation between fire and the rain. I found that the most significant predictor of fire spreading into rainforest was the amount of rainfall that had fallen in the 30 days prior to that fire starting. And I also found that that value was around 50 millimetres. In December 2015, tracking stations in Western Tasmania recorded less than 50 millimetres of rain, creating the necessary conditions for bushfire. We're very used to having that on the dry east coast, and we've got dry forest types, but up in the northwest, those values are unprecedented. It's been the driest period on record for that area. When dry lightning struck Tasmania in January 2016, the fires spread fast in the rainforest and also in the peatlands. With no rainfall to keep it damp, the peat dried and turned to fuel. The ground itself caught fire. For the pencil pines that depend on peat to survive, it was devastating. Thousand-year-old clusters of pencil pines were destroyed as the peatlands burned. An ancient landscape was devastated almost overnight, the casualty of global changes. We're seeing different patterns of lightning and associated rain. We're seeing much drier soil conditions than what have been recorded in the past, so one would just have to assume that that's a result of, of climate change. Under the current trend we're seeing, it's difficult to imagine populations like this surviving at the end of the century, because they're just eventually going to be picked off. At what point do we say that the ice sheet broke up? At what point do we say climate change caused this? 
As far as I'm concerned, because I'm so immersed in seeing strange fire events around the world and studying them, when I saw this one, I just said, well, we might as well call it what it is, it's climate change. Since records began, Australia has warmed by at least 1.4 degrees Celsius, and that's certain to increase. All over the world, ecosystems are being reshaped by changing climate, and in Australia, there's a fear that hotter, drier summers will lead to increasingly severe fire seasons. So what can we learn about future fires by examining Australia's climatic history? To understand how climate has shaped fire in Australia over time, in 2016, Dr. Scott Mooney from the University of New South Wales dug down into our past. So we take sediment cores to look at charcoal records back through time because the, the fire history of Eastern Australia is relatively short. So we're trying to extend the record because uh, with longer records, you can look at things like whether there's cycles in the record. There's, there's quite a bit of charcoal in here. Charcoal is deposited in the ground after fires. In damp areas like swamps and peatlands, it can be preserved for tens of thousands of years, each layer of earth serving as a marker for periods of high or low fire occurrence. We're counting charcoal back through time and as a proxy of fire, and we discovered that actually there's a whole lot of history, prehistory, if you like, that we only imagined. We see a lot more ups and downs in the fire history, and uh, we also see that fire tends to follow uh, climatic cycles and particularly climatic variability. The past 30,000 years saw an ice age come and go, long periods of heat and dry and periods of wetter weather. One of the interesting things that's, that's coming out of this work is that climate variability seems to drive fire. Climate change is giving us fire. And it doesn't matter which way the change is, whether it's wetter or drier or hotter or colder, the change itself seems to drive fire in our landscape. Into the future, we can only expect more fire. As the climate changes faster than at any time in the last 30,000 years, we can expect fires on a scale we haven't seen before. And these intense fire seasons aren't in the distant future, they're already here. The scale of the 2019-2020 uh, summer bushfires was extraordinary. We had the hottest day on record. We had the hottest week on record. We had the hottest month on record and we've had the hottest summer ever. The summer of 2019 to 2020 became known as Black Summer. Across Eastern Australia, fires burned for months. But the most serious blaze of Black Summer almost never happened. On October 26, 2019, a fierce storm passed over Sydney and crossed the Blue Mountains to the west. This storm front brought hail, strong winds and lightning. Meteorologists tracked its progress with satellites recording 19,100 lightning strikes. At the very end of the storm, lightning strike number 19,068 struck a tree in Wollamai National Park. The stringy bark tree absorbed about a billion joules of electrical energy, which instantly translated into a burst of intense heat. Every big fire starts as a little fire. If it's a lightning strike on a remote mountain in a national park, 50 kilometres from the nearest town. No one's going to see it until it's a big fire. This thermal image shows the progress of the fire. After two and a half hours, the isolated blaze had burnt through 65 hectares, 
So it, it goes through a transition stage where it's just burning ground fuels, but it very quickly gets into the treetops, creates a convection column, which intensifies the wind and then starts spotting and it feeds its own intensity. Water bombers were called in, but couldn't extinguish the flames. On November 12th, the fire burst out of control. Driven by strong winds, the Gosper's blaze doubled in size, covering more than 56,000 hectares. There's not really any words that summarise the intensity of that fire. The heat, the smoke, the noise. Lightning lit three more fires outside the containment lines. The Three Mile Creek, Little L Complex and Thompson's Creek fires were born. As these fires expanded, computer simulations predicted they would merge. When they combined with the Gosper's mountain blaze, they created a mega fire. So as the smoky hot fire rises up into the atmosphere, they can eventually generate thunder cumulonimbus systems around the smoky heat. The fire can literally make its own weather. So it's a bit like a fireplace in a home. The chimney is designed to make air draw in at the base and make that fire burn more intensely. That's exactly what the convection column does. A pyrocumulonimbus is a fire-generated thunderstorm reaching up to 12 kilometres above the ground. Able to generate their own lightning strikes, these firestorms are apocalyptic in scale, and they're becoming more common. Between 1978 and 2018, there were about two recorded in New South Wales. In the black summer, there were about 45, and I saw several. I fought fires with these storms raging. No rain, but just incredible downdrafts, winds, trees being blown over, and lightning causing new fires up to 30 kilometres away. Eventually, the Mount Gosper's fire was stopped by wet weather and the natural barrier of the Hawkesbury River. We were just very fortunate that when it reached the Hawkesbury River, the weather conditions moderated, we were able to back burn from the river. If that had not been the case, it would have hopped across and into suburbia. We would have lost thousands more homes. The Gosper's Mountain fire burned for over 46 days. But this was just one of hundreds of fires that burnt across Eastern Australia in the summer of 2019 to 2020. When the Black Summer fires ended, 34 lives had been lost. In the end, more than 12 million hectares of land was burnt across New South Wales, Victoria, and parts of Queensland, Southern Australia, and even Tasmania. They had a catastrophic effect on Australia's natural ecosystem. Burning out vegetation, forests, low-lying grasslands, decimating agricultural systems, and then the horrendous images of Australia's native wildlife caught up and impacted by the fires. Over 186,000 square kilometres were burnt and over 3 billion animals were killed or displaced. But we've got to keep going. We've got to learn lessons from these events 
take the knowledge, take the science, take it back to communities, to decision makers, to governments, to help them think through the process about how we're going to adapt, change our ways, adjust to a new normal in the future. The Black Summer fires made clear the interdependence of humans and the natural environment. There's a new generation of Australians who are trying to reach an understanding of what it means to live in this country with all of its toxic species and its extreme climate and everything else. And in a sense, I think that we, we have to reach back in time for answers to that. Among the many responses to the Black Summer fires is a renewed appreciation for the way the original Australians managed the land and the risk of fire prior to the arrival of Europeans. There's a lot of people out there trying to transfer knowledge from, for example, Bundjalung land up in northern New South Wales to the Sydney region, to Darug land, teaching people how to do these burning techniques. I'm a, a wallable Bundjalung man um, through my heritage and um, traditional knowledge about cultural burning is scientific. Um, it's perhaps not what we classify as Western scientific knowledge, but there is definitely a science to what the old people were doing out in the country in the old days. In an era of megafires, traditional burning is more important than ever. Every year, the top end of Australia burns. In 2007, uncontrolled wildfires seen here in red burnt an area the size of the United Kingdom. Those fires alone pumped more CO2 into the atmosphere than all Australia's coal-fired power stations combined. We need to do something. This is all part of it. it. It comes from our own greenhouse strategy. To reduce carbon emissions, the Northern Territory government is supporting a return to traditional fire management practices. In Kabul Wanamu in Arnhem Land, Traditional owners are working to re-establish the old ways. This fire brigade doesn't put fires out, it starts them. The traditional strategy is to light cool fires while walking through the bush to reduce fuel and also create fire breaks. So in the afternoon you, you take a fire and it, it travels very slowly. It's important to us to come back and do our burnings in our country. To scale up the operation, the rangers have to take to the air. Traditional knowledge of the land dictates where the fire breaks should fall. To light fire breaks in inaccessible terrain, the rangers drop balls loaded with chemicals that ignite on impact and start small fires. See if that we have a good uh, line that puts through here, uh, not burning big or whatever, the flames are real nice and low. These fire breaks create barriers that stop the more intense fires later in the year. But to prove that this practice reduces CO2 emissions, scientists need to gather data. The rangers of Kabul Wanamu hosted an international team of scientists to determine how much carbon was being saved. The team burnt a hectare of bush measured heat radiation, particles in the smoke, and took thermal imaging from the air. Ecologist Andrew Edwards and his team document the fires of Northern Australia. This is just two years of litter, and the leaf litter is 250 grams. Well, oh, it's by sampling material from plots of land burnt at different times of the year, the rangers are able to determine how successful the coal burns have been. This is site 27, it's the litter sample. 
and we have these ash samples and other burnt materials that are there. We weigh all of that. 27, 50 grams. The amount that was there before the fire, minus the amount that we've collected after the fire, is the amount that's gone up into the sky as a greenhouse gas. Research shows that a hectare burnt in May releases half the emissions of a hectare burnt during a hot November wildfire. Across Arnhem Land, projects like this reduce carbon emissions by as much as 800,000 tonnes a year. The ranges not only reduce the intensity of bushfires and draw down emissions, but by selling carbon credits can also create a new income for their remote community. I think there's a real, I guess, opportunity for reconnecting Indigenous people with country, even out in remote areas, and applying that, those cultural burning practices as perhaps a way of stopping these large fires escalating. Fuel reduction, whether by prescribed burns or traditional indigenous land management, is one part of the solution to increasing risk of fire. In the battle to protect lives and property from future fires, scientists and firefighters are banding together to come up with innovative technological responses. One of these programs, known as Fire Shield, brings together dozens of organisations to find new ways to fight fires. Fire Shield is a national Apollo-style mission to be able to identify and extinguish any dangerous fire within an hour. And it's an incredibly audacious goal. We've set ourselves a target of 2025 to achieve it. Working with scientists, academics and bushfire behaviourists, FireShield aims to bring 21st century technology to bear in the ancient battle against bushfires. Because fighting megafires is increasingly difficult, one emphasis is on detecting and extinguishing fires early. One of the only things you can do to get the edge with fires is to detect them very, very quickly and to take action very, very quickly. And with remote areas, that means possibly using satellites, drones, aircraft, automatic lightning detection. Today, 95% of fires in Australia are detected by triple zero calls. We can do better than that. Using technology developed to fight fires in California, FireShield hopes to employ satellites, fixed cameras, and machine learning to spot fires almost as soon as they break out. Teaching computers to recognise fires allows for the automation of a process that has, up until now, been left to the naked eye. Increasingly sophisticated imaging, including LiDAR and satellite-based sensors, are able to tell fire behaviourists how much fuel lies in the path of a possible fire creating a detailed nationwide model of how fires might move and grow, allowing for rapid deployment of resources. If we can have infrared thermal imaging, satellite detection, and then get aircraft dropping water and retardant on them while we winch in specialist fire crews, we might be able to get the upper hand on some of them. New technologies are also being developed to help volunteers prepare for the shock of fighting a megafire. A new firefighter going to their first big fire, it's a very confronting situation. OK, coming this way. They looked at flames that could be 20 to 30 metres high. Wind so strong that it would knock you over smoke so thick that you can't breathe. The heat, people don't realise the heat. People afterwards are often really shell-shocked. They just say, I had no idea how frightening that would be. To help new firefighters prepare, virtual reality suits are being developed to train them before they get close to a megafire. We think about it as putting on a pair of virtual reality goggles, but it's much more interesting. 
It's haptic technology in suits, and suits that can uh, actually heat up so that someone can feel, feel the experience of fighting a fight and being in an immersive environment. It, it's not only good because it can train firefighters and keep them out of harm's way while they train up, it also ensures that they're not learning on the job for the first time. The hope is that investing in cutting edge technology to predict, detect and extinguish fires before they become mega fires will pay dividends. The best response though is a proactive one and a preventative response. So right now the system is very reactive. When there's a crisis we jump in and we respond to it. What we need to do is to flip it and we need to think about an integrated approach to get ahead of the fires in time and space to be faster in our response and more effective. We're constantly learning and we need to be adaptive to that and as new techniques come out or new technology comes out, we need to be uh, ahead of the curve and, and take that on board and use it to the best advantage because we need to protect the community. When I look at the unfolding disasters, the disasters we've been through and how more frequent they're becoming, how much more severe, I realise we're all in this together. We can't leave it to emergency services. We definitely can't leave it to politicians. All of us need to take action if we're going to secure a safe future.